Hello, and welcome to the Aquarius Podcast, your source for interviews with people from all across the tropical fish keeping hobby. I'm your host, Randy Reed. Please subscribe and check out all previous episodes on Podbean, Stitcher, Google Play, iTunes, or AquariusPodcast.com. You can also check out additional content by following the Aquarius Podcast Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter accounts. If you like what you hear, please rate and leave a review for the show. Enjoy the interview. Today's date is Monday, April 23rd, 2018. My guest today is Kevin Kelly. Kevin is the owner of Brooklyn Hardscape, an aquascaping company and YouTube channel where he hosts live streams and shares videos of his work. Kevin has also competed in numerous aquascaping competitions. So Kevin, welcome to the Aquarius Podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for uh, jumping on. Um, so, you know, just to jump right into it, what got you into the hobby? What are some of your earliest memories um, of keeping fish in a glass box, Kevin? Uh, it's kind of a, a long story, but to sum it up, uh, in my late 20s, mid late 20s, uh, I was having a hard time. I was uh, headed to a bad place. Uh, there was a lot of bad things happening in my life. And uh, I was talking to somebody and they like, have you ever heard of Planet Tanks? And uh, it became a form of therapy for me, kind of straightened me out. Uh, so I kind of did that on my own for a long time. I'm not a big fan of the Internet, especially then. And then a couple of years down the road, uh, a friend of mine, uh, my friend Phil, he was like, oh, have you ever heard of PlanetTank.net? You should start going on there. I went on there. I have a background in science after picking a lot of fights with people. Uh, I found Facebook, and then it's been kind of a slow growth since then. Uh, I've been doing it for uh, about 14 years, and uh, really doing the the higher end creative stuff has been about five years. Wow, that is uh, you know definitely an interesting way to get into the hobby, and you know for your situation, I'm I'm very glad that you know your friend Phil introduced you to aquascaping, and that it was able to be a, a great source of. Um, as you call the therapy for you, and it was very therapeutic, um, you know, and, and I guess, and not to, to poke too much fun, but my personality, um, aquascaping has kind of frustrated me. So did you have any of those frustrations when you first started, or was it just a very, you know, is your personality such that it was just a really calming um, or an, kind of an enlightening experience? Oh, no, I've had some, some frustrating moments uh, because I was a bit of a luddite in the beginning. Uh, I've had things like at my first rimless tank. I didn't know about having a leveling mat underneath it. Set it up. I was very proud of this tank. Uh, about four hours later, my apartment got flooded. Uh, I guess a grain of sand had gotten between the glass and the stand, and the weight just just shattered the whole tank. Uh, I was I was ready to give up after that. I was afraid I was going to lose my apartment as well. Um, there's been a lot of other frustrating moments. I've done tanks. I've thought of re they're really awesome. And I get them going for like two weeks and just algae farms or I didn't plan out the flow well enough. And I'll just end up taking the whole damn thing and just dumping it in the trash and starting from scratch. So I've had a lot of frustrating moments. Wow. So on, <laughs> on the note of the rimless tank, I mean, I, I like to ask for kind of the lessons learned from my guests. But I mean, right off the bat, like that is a that's a that's a really good pro tip lesson learned right there. Where if you're going to go with a rimless tank, uh, make sure you put that leveling pad in there. It's true. It's uh, I've seen a lot of other things. Um, when I was uh, in Europe last year, Yoris even told me, you know, make sure like you, it's a good idea when you're using wood to always have a piece of plexiglass or something between uh, the hardscape and the glass. He had a, a log expand as it got waterlogged and broke the, the tank as well. So there's there's always really hard lessons no matter how good you are. Wow, that is that's also something else I never would have thought of. My goodness. Yeah, there's uh, <laughs> there there's definitely a lot that you need to uh, to be considered of, and I'm I'm sure though on Facebook pages and in you know old school forums, hopefully there's some sticky notes of you know read this before you get started. Um, so you know if, if you're going down your aquascaping adventure, um, those are things that you can be wary of. Um, and if not, you know that's why guys like uh, like yourself, Kevin, you know you've set up these companies, Brooklyn Hardscape, where just reach out to Kevin and consult with him and uh, hire him to come and help you do your aquascape. So that's always another good option as well. Yes, absolutely. Yes, please hire me to come do your aquascapes. <laughs> so, so, so let's talk. Um, so you you got into aquascaping. Um, at, at, you know, is again kind of your your uh, to to be therapeutic. Um, you know, how did the fish? Uh, enter into the picture? I mean, were you always just aquascaping with plants or were, were fish an afterthought? Like what was your decision early on of how you'd incorporate fish, if at all? 
Uh, like everything, it's been a, an evolution. Um, I would just throw fish in whatever I, if I saw something cool, I would just throw it in there. Uh, I've killed a lot of fish, a lot of fish, uh, either gassing them with CO2. Uh, plants have always been my main concern, layout and plants. Uh, then uh, two years ago, three years ago, I uh, developed a relationship with Rachel O'Leary. And now one of my major focuses when I'm designing a tank, I, I'm a big planner, so I plan from start to finish. And now I look at, you know, where these, what fish I want in there. So I'm doing the layouts. I'm also planning what fish I'm going to be in there, even before I put a, a single rock into a tank. Uh, many times I'll email Rachel and be like, okay, like, who do I talk to? I want to do fit this fish with this tank. Uh, so now it's, it's now like a cohesive environment. And there are, there are tanks that I do that I never plan on putting fish in. Uh, I've had clients who agree they will have like, you know, like four nano tanks and, when you have a tank that's like 5.5 gallons, it's either shrimp or nothing, in my opinion. I don't put fish in anything uh, smaller than a five-gallon tank. So it's all it's all a process. Wow, yeah, that's uh, yeah that that would be tough for me to to have a tank set up with. And, and granted, I mean your work is is beautiful. There's a lot of awesome aquascapes out there, um, but to not have a fish in an aquarium that would take a lot of uh, discipline on my part. I feel like if you set up one of those tanks for me and you left, you you know, if I ever showed you what it looked like again, there may be a fish in there. Oh, uh, maybe. I mean, people. <laughs> I had I had a client in December who definitely uh, it was definitely a nano fish tank. Uh, the, the original plan that I set it up for was uh, for I think a uh, 250 micro raspores, and instead of waiting for me to get the fish and stock the tank, they went on their own and put goldfish in it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and they called me up and they're like can you fix this and i was like i'm sorry i can't you can't afford for me to come in and fix it oh my goodness that's unfortunate so let's yeah. talk um you know to to unpack a little bit more your experience with co2 i know you said you had an unfortunate you know gassing of fish but um you know what have you learned now and what would be your pointers to somebody like myself who has recently started injecting co2 um, I've been fortunate to watch some videos uh, to get some insight, but if somebody didn't even have that or directly from, from Kevin's mouth, um, what are your kind of go-to and your tips for when, once somebody starts injecting CO2 into their aquarium? I think the most important part is if you are injecting CO2 and you want to have fish in them, uh, make sure the tank is as grown out as possible. Um, then you can lower the CO2 a little bit. You will probably get a little bit of algae, um, put the fish in and then start bringing the CO2 back up. It's important to remember that the dissolved CO2 in nature is significantly higher than probably you'll have in your tank. Uh, don't be afraid to use, uh, to aerate the tank, like get a little, uh, like a bubbler and put in the air in there, like fish. You'd be surprised the amount of uh, CO2 mixed with oxygen can exist in a tank and the fish can appreciate that as well. Um, it's all about the kinds of fish. Uh, like you would have, like if you have puffers, absolutely. I would say you need to aerate the tank. Uh, if you're doing something like Amazon Resporas or Tetras, you can really pump the CO2 in there and before they're, they'll be affected badly. Uh, it's about knowing what fish and where they come from and the dissolved CO2 in the water. There are, there are graphs out there. Um, you know, you can go to one of the science pages about the Amazon River and they have all this information about what's in the water, dissolved CO2, dissolved oxygen. Uh, what minerals are in there. It's just all about doing that extra legwork to make sure that your fish are healthy and you're not just throwing random fish in. Does that answer the question? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I guess just to share from my experience of, of injecting CO2, um, I guess one of the, the big things that I've learned is that when you watch a lot of the aquascaping videos, um, some of the B-roll, and from watching videos, I've learned this terminology B-roll. Um, never heard of that before. So they'll show they'll show the CO2 diffuser, and they're always at like max capacity. They're bubbling like crazy, and they look awesome, right? So it makes for that really good footage. Um, but then when I set my tank up, and, and knowing the advice and hearing that you need to be very conservative when you start injecting CO2, and you want to have um, a fairly you know, minimal bubble count um, just to get your system adjusted or not adjusted, but to get your system used to having the, the CO2 put into it. Um, I was very disappointed at the very slow trickle that came out of my CO2 diffuser. Like it wasn't that uh, torrent of CO2 bubbles coming out that I thought I was going to have. What, uh, what kind of regulator are you using? Uh, it is a, I mean, it's got the electric solenoid. Um, it's one of the Amazon specials. I think it was somewhere in the $80, $90 range. 
Okay. Uh, for me, I always tell beginners and they're always afraid of this, but, uh, for your, for a really good CO2 diffusion without making the bubbles going crazy and, but everything's really happy. Uh, definitely the output pressure, the PSI should be around 35 or 40. Okay. Uh, that way, you know, you have enough pressure where the disc will get an even uh, pressure coming from the inside and you'll get finer bubbles. You won't have to pump it. And then you just watch your plants. Uh, Again, it's all about making sure your plants are at maximum growth before you add, uh, you add the fish. And then you can dial it down. The plants can survive with a drop of CO2 for quite a while before you start getting adverse effects, unless you're, again, on like a nano tank where everything goes wrong in 30 seconds. Yeah, I think I've been fortunate. I mean, for one, I'm not a planner. I'm very impulsive. Um, <laughs> that's why <laughs> that's why I would need to hire somebody like you to really set me up if I was going to set up, you know, a real, um, you know, showpiece in in my front room or in my business. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I've got a 75 gallon that I'm injecting into. Um, I've got a handful of rainbow fish in there. Um, and it, so I, I think it's minimal on the stocking right now. They're still fairly young. And I did put a lot of plants in there. So uh, again, very conservative on the CO2. I'm not quite seeing the growth that I thought I was going to have as far as like, you know, I thought it was going to be this magic wand. You know, you start injecting CO2 and like the next day you wake up and it is just a jungle in your aquarium. And I, and I haven't had that experience yet. Um, at the same time, my fish are still all alive and they're eating very well. I do my regular weekly water changes. Um, so I, I think there's more I need to research, more I need to unpack and understand about, you know, the injecting of the CO2. Um, I do have the drop checker. So I have a Rhinox drop checker and that, you know, maintains that nice bright green that, the happy face on the box tells me I need to have. So that feels good. I mean, it's all about how far you want to push it as well. Uh, it's all about, you know, you add a little CO2, you see how the fish react. You wait a couple of days, add a little more CO2, see how the fish react. It's it's the patience. It take, took me about three years to start panicking. Um, you know, every time I'd raise the CO2, there I am like every hour watching the fish. Okay. The fish are still alive. Now I get, a, I have a little bit of an idea of what's going on and how to do it. So I can just add it and I feel kind of confident. Um, it's, it's just about playing with it and understanding that you're going to have to fail a few times before you really get it. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit more. The watching of the fish, um, as, as kind of a, one of the barometers, if you will, of how your, your, um, your C, your system is accepting the CO2. So, um, you know, it, it's not going to be a light switch, uh, a zero one thing where the fish is alive, swimming, happy, he's eating just fine. And then he's dead. I, I guess what were the signs that you were looking for to know if you need to back off on the CO2? Uh, normally you'll start seeing some heavy breathing. They'll be heading towards the surface. Uh, if the fish are already gulping air from the surface, uh, then you've definitely gone too far, but you just kind of watch them You'll see a little bit of heavy breathing start to happen. They'll start rotating towards the surface. If they're schoolers, they'll stop schooling or they'll school right by the outflow. Uh, when I see that, I know that, okay, got to raise the outflow, let it aerate, drop down one bubble. I don't know. A lot of people, that's the other problem. A lot of people just turn it all the way down, just lower one bubble. It's normally just that one bubble difference for a fish. Uh, I have a tank right now, uh, the, the tank that's all Tropica products, and I'm doing, I don't even know, maybe 30 bubbles a second. It's blasting, and the fish aren't, I'm still raising it. The fish don't mind. As long as you do it slow, the fish get adjusted. You know, there's a lot of uh, surface ripples, so I am losing quite a bit of CO2, but at the same time, the plants are all purling. They're very happy. Wow, so that's, uh, so there's two things there I, I want to talk about. One would be, um, I think, a great YouTube video would be um, showing various like bubbles per second. So people have a perspective on what does 30 bubbles per second look like versus what does three bubbles per, spec uh, per second look like. I think that would make for some pretty cool content. Um, again, I'm not a YouTube guy. Um, I'll throw that out there to you or anybody else out there if they feel the need to, to put that kind of video together. But that seems like something pretty cool. Uh, and then the second would be what you put in your bubble counter, because I've seen, you know, the the standard put your put water in there to uh, mineral oil and I think one other type of substance. And, and I've never, you know, I'm, I'm scared to do mineral oil, uh, but at the same time, I've filled it up two or three times and the water dissolves fairly quickly or evaporates or wherever it goes. Um, so I only I, I only use water. It's not worth uh, I've had too many diffusers and I've had a reactor uh, messed up by the mineral oil. Good luck trying to clean that out if it bleeds out, if you hit something too hard. And yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah, it's not it's not worth it. Um, only water. 
And once you get it dialed in, you don't think it's going to be going up anymore. I don't see a reason to keep it filled. I, half of my bubble counters are actually empty. There's nothing in them. I just, I look, okay, this is about where I am. And I raise it, uh, going to the, doing a video on, you know, bubbles per second. That's uh, that's another thing. Uh, everybody wants everything to be cookie cutter. This is, uh, how many bubbles per second I have, but you know, I have a Spyro uh, bubble counter. I have a straight up bubble counter. I have bubble counters that are attached to my CO2. And even though they're all at the same pressure, the, the bubble count's all different because it's a different shape, different size, uh, different compression that happens in the bubble counter itself. Um, it's, it's really hard to do a YouTube video on that because everything is inconsistent because there's so many different products. Are you telling Again, me, are you telling me I'm actually going to have to do work, Kevin, and count my own yes. damn bubbles? <laughs> that yes. Is, that is unacceptable <laughs> in this day and age, sir. <laughs> and you know what? The, so the, the funny thing as far as um, like being dialed in. So uh, if you've heard any of the episodes where I've talked about my breeding for karma tank, as I like to call it, instead of breeding for profit, um, it's got a guppy, col guppy colony. I'm sorry. That's just really exploding. Red cherry shrimp. I'm really enjoying this tank. Um, and it's got just – and I've it went from a 10-gallon to a 20-gallon long. Um, it's got this massive – just growth of guppy uh, guppy grass. I smart. I started with maybe a baseball size portion, and it's now taking up three quarters of a twenty long, uh, with some moss balls. I've got a really cool uh, boost uh, boost plant in there, and I mean this thing. There's like practically no algae whatsoever in this tank. Um, the I'm actually looking at the guppy grass purling, and I'm not injecting CO two. And the light on this thing is a is a cheapie from Amazon that I've been super thrilled with. So it's funny that the tank that I'm not even trying to grow plants or have do really well, they're purling, right? Like it's doing incredible. And then my main tank where I am injecting CO2, I'm having, all, you know, I'm not saying I'm having a ton of issues, but I'm battling algae. Uh, I'm trying to dial in the CO2. I'm trying to dial in ferts and light and all this stuff. And I, I don't know. It's like the harder I try, the more, you know, the less successful I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, the important thing to remember is it's one thing at a time. Um, I don't normally start adding ferts until four to six weeks in, uh, but you're also dealing with super nutrient hungry, uh, pond plants where, uh, everything makes them pearl. Uh, these plants aren't coming from a river where there's heavy flow. They're, they're coming, uh, the, the guppy grass is soft water. It's used to no flow, uh, doesn't need any nutrients. And also you have shrimp and they're keeping the algae away. I mean, it's, it's hard to be like, see there, right. Without, or it's hard to say what's going on without being there. That's uh, again, another problem with the internet. Uh, but I'm going to guess that it's your plant choice and your, 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 basically your flora and fauna choice. Uh, you're picking a really easy plant. Everything makes it pearl. Uh, I'm sure that you probably don't have heavy flow. You just have a, I don't even know what kind of filter you're using. Sponge, sponge filter. No sponge filter. Yeah. So there's not a lot of water movement other than, where the bubbles are coming out. Uh, it's a hard, again, I'm just shooting in the dark here, just throwing crap at a wall and see what sticks. No, uh, it, it, it's funny because it's just, again, it's all just, you know, not even trying, but what the choices I made. I mean, it's, it's a really good tank um, as far as just kind of being dialed in and balanced. And, um, you know, it, sure. I, I, I do. Um, I think that's a great point of the guppy grass, just kind of being, you know, this, super easy plant which you know i'm all for that um but yeah it's, it's just funny that i'm not even trying and it's just firing on all cylinders <laughs> i mean i i'm always amazed at plants uh there's a particularly hard plant uh synagalus giant it grows really well for me uh i forgot about it i left it in a bucket next to one of the tanks i had to work in georgia and alabama and i came back and the thing had tripled in size oh wow uh, no CO2, barely any light, just hanging in a bucket with some fish. I have no answers for you. Good times. You know, we should have reframed this episode to just be Kevin teaches Randy how to set up a planted tank. <laughs> <laughs> but we should definitely do a video or do a little thing for it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, if, if, you know, you want me to join in on your live stream, I've, I've joined in a couple times. And if you want to have, uh, you know, Kevin teaches Randy kind of corner of the episode where – Everybody on the internet gets to hear about how terrible I am with the uh, aquascaping and <laughs> making. Uh, a... I mean, I probably my my second worst client uh, was a guy, a Wall Street guy, who 
you know, I, his hand kept on, everything kept dying, everything. Uh, the fish, the plants, everything was turning to mush. Couldn't figure it out. Uh, of course, because I have a guarantee, I kept going back. It's on my own dime, stock in the tank, can't figure it out. Fourth time I'm there, I noticed the lights are on, but the CO2 is on. I'm talking to him. And he's like, well, you know, the light's so bright. I like watching TV in the dark, so I've been turning it off. And I asked him, how long uh, do you turn the light off for? Do you want me to rearrange the lights so it's, you know, the light's mostly on when you're not home? What would you like me to do? And he's like, oh, well, you know, after you leave, I normally just turn the light off. And I'm thinking in my head, so there's normally about a five-week, uh, between each visit, it's been about five weeks and he just he turns the light off as soon as i leave and he kept it off and so the plants were dying but the co2 was going on so it was gassing the fish oh my and goodness so i like confronted him and he was he was like well i don't understand i'm like well you know you can't turn off the light because the plants need the light they consume the co2 and he's like oh i didn't know plants needed light oh no <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a bad telling of the story but this guy makes more in a year than i'll probably see in a lifetime and no I'm, oh my goodness that's terrible all right well you know it's 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 your mission though right like part of uh part of what i want to do with this podcast is just find out how we continue to grow this hobby and, and get more people involved and you have a client kevin and you need to stick with him and you need to convert <laughs> him and have him share the love of aquascaping and aquariums with all of his Wall Street friends, and they can <laughs> they can shower you with dividends and all sorts of other earnings. Uh, well, I taught his maid. Now his maid takes care of the <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> hey, maybe she'll maybe she wants to get into aquascaping too. Uh, she did. She's in aquascaping now. Oh, awesome! Look at you. Excellent. <laughs> good job, man. You're doing. You're putting in the good work on the East Coast. Excellent. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm like you know I have I have no data to back this up. I'll have I'll have other episodes about it, but I'm very concerned about the state of the of the hobby. Um, you know, and I just want to make sure that you know we're the people that are currently in the hobby are doing we're doing everything that we can to try to get more people involved and have enjoyable experiences. So, uh, one of the one of the things I've been doing is I've been traveling as I've been talking to shops. Uh, I had a chance to talk to a couple shops when I was down south. Uh, I did, unfortunately, did not get a chance to talk to Premier Aquatics. I just buzzed in and buzzed out. But um, I talked to Kyle at Alabama Pond and uh, Aquarium and Pond. And one of the things we talked about is that to grow the hobby, you really need to show it more. Um, which means if you have a favorite shop and you live in the middle of nowhere, uh, get one of the, the get an aquascaper, come in, do a show tank. I'm going to start traveling, trying to do show tanks at some of these um, spots. and I mean, I, I have, when I do like Reef of Palooza, the competition of Reef of Palooza, or I'm doing a tank in somebody's house, uh, one of the things that they say is, especially with the brighter plants, these are the same colors or similar colors as coral or just as, uh, just as colorful as coral. Uh, but it's easier, sometimes it can be easier to take care of, or you can have a greater variation of fish or plants. Uh, but people need to see it more. If you want to grow the hobby, one of the things is you need to get these tanks in the shops. Uh, not so there's just an entity online. Uh, one of the hard, like it's really hard for people to look at a picture and say, "I can do that." They need to physically see it. Now, this may be dangerous, but is there is there any opportunity to collaborate with the big box stores? I mean, you know, there's no denying the amount of foot traffic that a PetSmart or a Petco gets on a given day. Um, you know, really partnering with them to to showcase what aquascaping is. Um, and again, I think that's a whole other series of episodes in and of itself, but, you know, as far as getting it in front of people, um, you know, some of these specialty fish stores, not, you know, your average person's not necessarily going to go in there, but in our, you know, American strip malls that we have, uh, I, I, it feels like every new shopping center has a pet smart or a pet co and people that are looking to kill time. If there's a movie theater in the parking lot, they're always going into the pet smart and pet co. And, you know, even if I don't need anything for, for fish stuff, I, I take my son in there on the weekend just to walk around and look at the different animals. So, you know, to me, that seems like one place where it, it would be a real natural fit. Um, now, whether or not it's even feasible, uh, that's a, that's a different question. It's all about whether the big box stores want to invest the money in the training. Um, I was at, I had a client in Philadelphia for a while and I needed some emergency supplies. I didn't bring, uh, I needed prime, uh, when I was there and also, uh, Seachem Excel. And I went to a local PetSmart and of course they didn't have it. So I had to figure something else out, but 
you know, when I was there, I noticed, for instance, that the a bunch of African cichlids were in their saltwater section. And I said something. I was like, these aren't saltwater fish. I know they look like they're saltwater fish. And I got attacked, essentially, verbally abused. Because, uh, you know, I was putting up a fight because I cared about the fish. Uh, and it just shows the bad training and bad labeling. Uh, I just don't think the big box stores are ready now to to start investing money and time. They will start selling supplies. I'm positive of that. I know that uh, some of the, the larger companies, European companies, have already talked to Petco and PetSmart. I know uh, different people are trying to get products onto the shelves. So they're feeling the pressure. Um, we'll see. You know, only time will tell. But uh, for the for the the mid to higher end stuff, it might be a little bit harder. Uh, Petco is great for getting sand, and maybe in the future it'll be great for getting aqua soil and get and be, being a reasonable price. But for now, it's it's a waiting game. Yeah, interesting. Now, I, I do want to go back and ask you. Now, were you verbally assaulted because it was a big box store, or because it was Philadelphia, and that's how the people in Philly are? <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I'm not a big fan of Philly, but uh, for other reasons. <laughs> I've got but, a, uh, I got a good buddy on our team. He just moved back to uh, to Philadelphia from Seattle, so uh, I got to give a little a little hard time to to the city of, of brotherly love. <laughs> there's not much brotherly love. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we don't we don't want to bash Philly too much. I mean, there's only a handful of people that listen to this podcast, and hopefully, none of them are in Philly right now. And if you are, uh, your cheesesteaks are wonderful. Although it's very uh, it's very intimidating to order a cheesesteak in your city. So I will, I will say that I feel like that they're just like, I can't spit my order out fast enough. And they just, like, they just want to take my money, throw a cheesesteak in my hand and get me out of their door. All right, Kevin. So let's, uh, let's pivot and talk about, um, so then, you know, as you, you got an aquascaping, so then how do you pivot into competing in aquascape competitions? Uh, I did it on a, um, I did it, did it a couple of times online. And then for me doing the live aquascaping, uh, I did the reef of Palooza, uh, Dustin's fish tanks aquascaping competition and um, that, that competition kind of changed everything for me uh, Dustin took me aside he had a long talk to me he's like I love your stuff your tanks are great uh, you should start doing more of these competitions you start getting online getting on Facebook groups like getting more active uh, it was all around a learning experience I had a vision uh, I was an hour late because I had to drive through a, a gay pride parade which was interesting uh, but for the aquascaping competitions, for me, it's all about preparation, planning, um, trying to get a sponsor to help you out, local shop or, you know, one of the bigger names. I know that Tropica helped out last year, Aquatic Experience. Uh, it's just all prep. It's all just coming in and plopping it down and getting it done. So can you kind of walk through maybe that particular aquascaping experience, but in general, like, you know, if somebody out there, it's certainly not me, I can assure you of that, but they're thinking, hey, you know, I've got a pretty nice aquascape at home, there's going to be one in my local area, like, what could somebody expect, because, um, you know, you're talking about having an idea beforehand, uh, being prepped, having sponsors, in my head, I envision, like, you just show up blind um, and you know, you have no idea, like plants are provided, the tank is provided, but it sounds like that's not necessarily the case. Uh, it depends on the competition. Every competition is different. Uh, that year that I was talking about, uh, plants were provided. You got seven tissue cultures. Um, but yeah, growing out stuff. Uh, my big thing is that I'll take a wicking fabric. Most competitions you have three to six months notice before they're going to happen. Uh, I get a wicking fabric like Hygrolon, and uh, for carping plants, I'll grow it all out on the Hygrolon. Um, just grow out as many plants as I can. I think uh, Aquatic Experience 2016, I showed up with 106 different species of plants. I had just a giant cooler full of plants because I wasn't sure what I was going to need. I wasn't sure if some of my fellow competitors needed things. And that's kind of like how I roll. I literally just collect plants for six months and then bring everything, including my plan, because nothing ever goes to plan ever. You never know what's going to happen. Wow, that's that's incredible. So you then you're growing out these plants um, and, and then like what's what's the setup timeline look like? Like you get there, the you know, the sound of the gun, everybody competitors, you know, start scaping like typically how long do you have to do your scape? Um, and what are some of the challenges that you face when you're actually doing the aquascape in the heat of the moment? I think the, the, uh, the greatest challenge is time management. Uh, aquatic experience, you have a day and a half. Uh, Reef Palooza, you have six hours, seven hours. 
Um, I did one at the NEC. Again, you have a day and a half. Uh, it's it's all about, but I again, I'm always the last one to finish because I have poor uh, time management because there's always one thing I got to hide, one little thing I got to add. So probably uh, using your smartphone to time manage. That's the most important part. And then the second, of course, is uh, dealing with the other competitors. Um, it's really important that you have a good relationship with them. You never know what you're going to need from them, what they might need from you. Uh, camaraderie is also really, really important. Uh, there was a competition, one of our competitors, uh, he didn't come very well prepared. He looked around what was going on. He got frustrated and left. And we had to like get him to come back and we all pitched in to help him and he did a pretty good job. Um, it, it's really important to be good to your fellow skaters because if you're not, and you're the guy that's unprepared, for instance, you know, you really want these guys to help you out as well. Uh, so I guess camaraderie, making sure that you're, you know, nice to everybody and everybody should be helping everybody. Even though it's a competition, it's not, it's, you just shouldn't be trying to undermine people. Having a good attitude is really important. I, I think that answers your question. Yeah. So by and large, I mean, do you typically find then that most people in the, in the aquascaping community um, internationally or maybe here in the U S um, are, are, are fairly friendly or are there a couple bad apples out there where you're like, man, I can't stand that person. I've never met a competitor that I haven't gotten along with. Uh, it's normally just the fans or the people who want to get in there. People will push you aside, take a photograph or in my case, get under my armpit. And, uh, that's, that's the only bad apples I've seen so far. Wow, well that that's cool at least then that you know there's not uh you know there's not too much um you know infighting or competition amongst the competitors and you know like you've like you've laid out why you want to be friendly with people. Um again, I I'm very much, you know, a, a do unto others as you would have them do unto you kind of person. Um and for me, you know, n you know, the thought of somebody that isn't, you know, in kind of the team spirit or is all about winning winning winning, I mean that would really ruin the experience for me. Uh, but it's glad to hear, or it's good to hear rather, that that's not the case. Um, will you be competing in uh, Aqu Aquatic Experience 2018 in New Jersey? Oh, that's the plan. Uh, I'm gonna gonna bring the big guns this year. Do uh, do some stuff that hopefully not many people have seen. I'm showing up with a case of epoxy. Let's put it that way. <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, as, as people that listen to this know, and if you've heard any of my episodes, I I may be headed out there. I hope so. Uh, I really do. I have been watching or listening to your episodes. I really enjoyed them. Uh, I did have to do a lot of driving down south, and that's when I got caught up. And uh, I love this podcast is great. I love it. Awesome. You know, it, it's the guests. It's not me. I'm just uh, I'm just providing a medium for other people to discover really awesome people in the hobby that they may not know about. And um, because certainly, if this if this podcast was about me, nobody would listen. <laughs> because. <laughs> <laughs> You never know. I mean, people are voyeurs. They might you know, you have a, you have a sexy voice there. I can listen to it. You know, it's... Uh, th well, thank thank you very much. That's uh, that, that's a compliment, I guess. Uh, that that's one of the things that's been hardest to the hardest compliment is to hear that people say I have a voice for radio. They haven't said I have a face for radio, but they do say I have a voice for radio. Um, which you know, of course, when you hear yourself, you don't think that you think you sound like um, you know Mickey Mouse or or just some ridiculous cartoon character, but. <laughs> enough enough about my voice all right so then uh all right so yeah aquascape um aqu aquatic experience i'm sorry 2018 uh that'll be good times like i said i definitely want to get out there all right so let's talk about uh brooklyn hardscapes then so you, you know you're kind of this established competitor in aquascaping um when did you decide to do brooklyn hardscapes and what made that decision come around um, again, it was, a, it was a ball rolling that happened at that one competition. Um, we started off with four guys, uh, we we're going to do salt water and fresh water kind of wanted to start an insulation company, but, uh, it's, it's really hard. There's no money in it in the beginning. Was, I'm still not making money. And unfortunately, you know, one by one, they dropped off and I've just kind of been barreling ahead on my own. Uh, my neighbor and friend, Christian, I'm hoping he'll join up later down the road. Maybe we'll see where, where life takes him. Um, so right now, you know, and for me, it's just feeling things out. I don't advertise. I just, oh, I get on my clients word of mouth uh, and I'm trying to get into a different part of the game. I got to, I got to be honest with you. I don't do maintenance. I know that's where all the money is, but it's too heartbreaking for me. Uh, the things that people do to the tanks after I leave their house is just, it's too much. 
Yeah, that that's a bummer. Um, so, and how long have you been doing, uh, or how long has Brooklyn Hardscape been around? Uh, about two years. About two years. And we're about to go official and go to the next level. We're going to start, you know, we're, I'm in the process of getting uh, importing licenses. And so we're, we're taking it to the next level, or I'm taking it to the next level. Ah, oh, very uh, cool. Is there any sneak peeks you can provide, or are we just going to leave it at that for now? Uh, we'll just leave it at that for now. All right, sounds uh, good. Well, whenever whenever you do, you are ready for a big announcement, let me know. I'll give you a shout out on the show in the future. Um, yeah, exciting stuff. So uh, tell me about your travel then. You were down you were down south. So that was down south for Brooklyn Hardscape, correct? Yes. Okay, so what were you doing? Uh, I was supposed to do a couple of installations. Uh, one of them fell through. It didn't work out in Atlanta. So I did, an inst- I did uh, two tanks in Alabama and... Um, you know, pretty pretty basic nature aquarium stuff. Nothing exciting. It seems to be mostly what I do. People get uh, Takashi Amano's book, the, the the Nature Aquarium Complete Work Works, and they'll just pick a page and be like, I want a tank that looks like this. And when I first started out, I used to, you know, do a big, like, oh no, we're gonna take it to the next level. And I used to do all these crazy things. Turns out people don't like that. So uh, if you ever need a nature aquarium, I can probably pop. You know, I did a. Did a 120p in one day. That's uh, that's how fast I've gotten just doing nature tanks. Oh wow! Uh, <laughs> so it's um, yeah, most most stuff I do is pretty boring. The stuff I did and uh, oh god, I hope he's not listening to this, but uh, it's a pretty boring tank. Uh, a lot of green, uh, all ADA from front to back, and then I did a uh, Ultim uh, Nature Systems uh, version of the 90p, and that's that was also all ADA products from front to back. You, you say you say boring, but I like nature aquariums. I think they look pretty <laughs> awesome. So, and you're probably shaking your head like, "Well, that's because you're a newbie at aquascaping." Oh, that's not true. I know a lot of people who, uh, you know, I, I just like doing crazy rock work, and that's not for everybody. And it's really hard to maintain. Um, some of the geoscapes that I've done, you know, I'm in there once a week with a toothbrush or a steel uh, brush, and I'm scraping the rocks and making sure everything's good and you know, keeping the plants as trim as possible so I have good flow. Uh, the more complex the tank, the more maintenance. Um, so I, one, of the, one of my clients at one point was telling me, you know, they were told more light means more algae means more problems. But really, I have found that uh, more complex setups means more algae, more problems. It has nothing to do with light. I mean, you need good flow. You need the proper nutrients. You need to make sure the nutrients are getting everywhere that they're going. And that's a lot of hard work when you have a lot of, a lot of stone work and a, a lot of things blocking the flow. And where you have, like right now, I am having a problem about the scrap escape because uh, mono shrimp have decided to become burrowers and they've undermined the entire structure of the uh, little nano that I did. So I had to rip it all apart and start over. Oh, but yeah, that's one thing you can't control, right? What the animals are going to do. Yes, and I've never known uh, a mono shrimp to be burrowers before, so it's it's a pain. Interesting, just a, a a crazy batch of a mono, or is it maybe a different substrate or different plants that you know, kind of that combination of um, you know those three things together just led to the amanos doing a different behavior. I have no idea. Uh, that's what I'm trying to figure out. That's why I haven't broken down the tank yet. Um, kind of watching them. Uh, feeding them a bunch. Maybe I thought they were foraging for food, so I've been feeding them. Nothing that hasn't changed. It's just getting worse. Uh, they are growing at an exponential rate, so I know there's a lot of algae in the tank they've been consuming. So maybe they're burrowing. So you know they shed, and then they burrow until their shell hardens, and then they come back out. That's my standing theory. Oh wow! So then uh, I'm also curious. Then so obviously Brooklyn Hardscape. You are in New York, which is not in the South. So how did these people get a hold of you? Uh, the Atlanta client was a client that I did uh, one of his tanks here in the city. He's a uh, he's a uh, in, in the movie business, and he has a house in Atlanta and a house here in New York. Uh, so he just wanted me to do another tank for him. And then the Alabama uh, client uh, just you know found me on Instagram. Oh wow, that is very cool. And it, and as a part of um, your your fee is is being flown out there a part of that, or is that still on your dime? And it's just something that you you know you'll do. Uh, for the for more exposure and just to to get a chance to you know spread Br- Brooklyn hardscape around the country. Oh no no I have a I have a day rate and then you pay for my accommodations and flight. Oh wow! So if I were to put you on like Value Jet, uh, you know, one engine aircraft and uh, put you up in a La Quinta down the road, what, does that suffice, or is there a little bit of a higher quality standard for you? Uh, 
I've been in that situation already. I now I, I would prefer something a little nicer. Uh, please don't <laughs> stick me in a in an airplane seat that's made for a midget. So Kevin, uh, Kevin, there's a thing called the Oregon Trail that uh, was really popular back in the day. I think we might be able to get you over. <laughs> If you leave now, you may beat when you may beat winter two two thousand eighteen. <laughs> just go, just don't get dysentery or bit by a rattlesnake along the way. Oh, I'll, I'll immediately resort to cannibalism. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good times. Uh, so, any international work? Have you have you done anything across the border in Canada, or are you you, you know planning on trying to get some international clients? I'm hoping to. Uh, I've been working on it. Uh, I'm going to be in Germany next week or in two weeks. I'm leaving for Germany on the 6th or 7th. Uh, but I mean, the competition, I mean, I, I give myself maybe a six out of 10 uh, in general, but over Europe, I'm just a little tiny guppy. I'm like a three out of 10. So uh, the European aquascapers are some of my favorite. Uh, if you haven't looked at any Philippe Alavera stuff, he is kind of who I want to be when I grow up. Oh, wow. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, I'll have to get a, a link from you and put that in the show notes for people to check out. So what exactly, yeah. what do you got going on in Germany? Uh, I'm going to Interzoo. Uh, so I'm, you know, all part of the grand plan of what's happening with Brooklyn Hardscape in the next couple months. But uh, Interzoo is one of the larger uh, pet traits shows in the world. So I'm going to go and I'm going to be talking to some people. Uh, hopefully have a chance to actually see Philippe and some of the other aquascapers that I've worked with. Uh, I know Oliver Knott, Oliver Knott is going to be there. Uh, I just recently got his soil. So I'm going to be doing a test drive with his soil. Uh, so we'll, you know, hopefully I'll have something to talk to him about. I did uh, stop at one of the shops that he worked for in Alabama and I got a chance to see one of his tanks there and, you know, get a chance to show him the pictures of it and see how he feels about it. Uh, talk to him because I want to do the same thing at that particular shop. Uh, and a couple of the other, other people that I've, I've met in my travels will be there uh, and I can just apply them for advice. Uh, one of the things that I've discovered with the European aquascapers is they're very, very free with good advice. Oh, wow. Very cool, man. So I, I'm going to say, I, I know that, you know, you're, you're running your own business and, you know, oftentimes there's a lot of work that goes into it. Uh, but you, the fact that you're traveling around, um, you're going across the, going across the Atlantic to, to Germany to, to do this interview, interview for work. I mean, that, that kind of feels like living the dream. Like, you know, are, have you ever reflected on that to, from, uh, you know, before you got into, uh, aquariums and aquascaping to kind of where you are now and, you know, does it, does it feel surreal at all? Uh, it definitely feels surreal. Uh, especially, I get fan mail. That's that's the most surreal thing that I the traveling. I, I traveled a lot in my twenties. I've been all over the world, um, seen I guess five continents or something like that. And uh, I don't actually enjoy traveling that much. <laughs> so it's the uh, it's the fan mail that really uh, throws me off uh, when people email me out of the blue from Australia. And are like, oh, I saw you did this tank and, you know, actually all those plants, you know, grow in Australia. Like, can you come out to my club and and uh, and give us a talk? I mean, unfortunately, going to Australia to go talk at a plug at a club isn't in my budget. Actually, when I was traveling now, I got a, a club from Bermuda emailed me and they're like, we would like you to come and speak at a club. We love your work. Getting those kind of emails is is absolutely surreal to me. Uh, in my mind, I'm still like this little little guy escaping in a corner that nobody pays attention to. Wow, that's really cool. I mean, so far the only person that wants me to speak at their club is a Nigerian prince, and I <laughs> and, I, and I, I have to send him money first. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to take him up on that offer. No, that's that's really cool, Kevin. I don't want to make light of that, but that's uh, that that is pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what to do with it. It's it's very off putting. <laughs> It's like, how did, how did you get to the, you know, it's like you, you're just re reflecting inward, like, you know, how, how, you, how you got to this point. And, um, yeah, like I said, just kind of kind of surreal, but very cool, man. I'm, I'm very happy for you. All right. So let, let's say somebody wants to, um, first off, somebody wants to go and check out your work. So I'm going to link it, but what are, where are good places that somebody can go and see uh, your portfolio of work that you've done? Um, I think right now my Instagram is probably one of the best places to peruse stuff. I've taken it down, pretty much try to empty out uh, the internet of a lot of the stuff that I didn't like, or uh, some of the clients that I've had, especially over the past six months, uh, I can't even photograph their house. Uh, I had a client, I had a big rush in December. I did uh, 21 
or 18 tanks in 21 days. And I'd say about half of them, I wasn't allowed to bring my cell phone into the condos that I worked in. Um, I had a manservant hire me for one job, uh, which is also kind of surreal. Uh, but yeah, definitely right now I'm focusing on, I, I kind of stripped myself down. I'm starting from the ground up trying to do relatable tanks. So Instagram is definitely the place to go. And then you can see what I've been doing in my aquascaping studio on YouTube. I try to do weekly updates. Yeah, I will say, you know, Instagram, um, I'm looking at your Instagram feed right now and even, you know, your posts that you put up there, there's just a lot of quality there, right? So I'm not even referring to the actual, you know, aquascape or the fish that you're showing. It's just the, the picture itself shows that you've put some time into this and it's not just like, Hey, here's a picture of a tank I've done. Let me throw a filter on there. Like it looks, it looks more meaningful and it looks like you, you've put more thought into it than that. Um, you've got some captions on there as well, but no, I mean, I think, uh, I think this is, you know, this is a, a great place for people to start to check you out that's brooklyn hardscape on instagram i will have um, a link to that in the show notes as well um and i guess what's kind of the uh what's the 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 process i guess if you know i'm local to you i'd love to have you come out here to seattle and help me out with my tank so maybe uh you know whenever you are out here maybe it's aga next year um if i haven't completely wrecked this tank or if i have another one i want help with you know have you come out and um, do some consulting with me. Uh, but if somebody on the East Coast, you know, in one of the, what is it, the five boroughs of New York? Did yes. I, did I, oh, there we go. Look at that. A West Coast boy is getting it right. I think <laughs> I think I only know that from the Gangs of New York movie. So the, the, so somebody's in the five boroughs and uh, they they want to hire you. So what is that what is that process like? Uh, normally you can just email me at info at brooklynhardscape.com. And then we begin and we talk about sometimes, especially local people, uh, Sometimes if, if you're not making a lot of money or, you know, I, I'm willing to work with you on your budget. And that's like the one, the one of the things that I really try to focus on. I really want people to have these tanks so we can work out stuff. Um, definitely worked for beer more than once. That is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Old school barter style, right? But I mean, I'm not, don't, don't have me work for beer and then have me come to your $3.5 million condo because that's also happening. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, pay pay this man. It's all about. The, uh, I was gonna say it's all about the profit motive. So good times, yeah. So I would highly encourage uh, all my listeners, you know, especially if you're on the East Coast, um, check out Kevin's uh, Facebook, check out his Instagram. Uh, I'll have all the links in the show notes, so you can click on it from there. Um, yeah, so I mean, fantastic. And if you want Kevin to come out and do some aquascaping. Hit him up, send him an email, send him an Instagram message, and uh, and set some set some time up. So Kevin, I also like. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no, go for it. Uh, also, like if, if anybody, I love speaking in clubs. I think that's where my some of my favorite uh, memories are of aquascaping right now is just traveling to go speak at clubs. So uh, if you have a club you'd like me to come to, please contact me. Yeah, and absolutely. As we, you know, we just kind of talked about in the uh, in the initial CO two section of this interview. I mean, you are incredibly knowledgeable. Um, even some of the facts that you're dropping is just kind of like offhand parts of the conversation. I mean, you know your stuff. Um, you know, and I, I would say that I would have to imagine that that rolls itself very well into a, a fish club presentation. Um, yeah, so so have Kevin come out, and maybe I'll see if I've got any pool and uh, have you out here in Seattle to speak at our fish club. Oh, that'd be fantastic. All right, Kevin. Oh, yeah. yeah, definitely. All right, Kevin, thank you very much for uh, joining me this uh, afternoon on the Aquarius Podcast. I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you again for having me. I really enjoyed this. All right, Kevin, I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thank you again for listening to the Aquarius Podcast. As always, get involved in your local fish club, help grow this wonderful hobby, and have fun with other fish nerds. <laughs>